Pleasure to be joined by you today, Kenny. What has this weekend been like? You know, you've been around so many legends from your era, from the current era. What's it been like mixing with the fans as well? It's been great, man. It's been great to be here. It's amazing to see how the sport has grown. You know, I'd always imagined that one day it would be like this. And uh, to see how fast and how far we've come is pretty tremendous. And of course, always cool to meet up uh, with guys that I came up with in my generation and of course to, to see so I didn't get a chance to say hello to Leon Edwards I was looking forward to do that he, you guys were all over him so I couldn't get a chance to talk to him but um, yeah no it, it's been great man and to see a turnout just on both sides is uh, tremendous and obviously we wouldn't be here without uh, these great fans just going back to very early in your, in your life was it a near-death experience that sort of inspired you to go and pursue your dreams? Can you go into what that was? Yeah, no, a uh, good question. I, I get this a lot. Um, you know, I, I think sometimes we have, uh, not sometimes, a lot of times, we have many fears um, with our willingness to do a certain thing. Uh, and sometimes it takes a big jolt. Uh, it takes maybe a scare or it takes um, a surprise or some kind of major event in your life to make that decision to ultimately do what you want to do. Um, and I was in Brazil, I was training jiu-jitsu. Um, I, I was married at the time. I was, uh, I got married young, I was like 23 years old. I was in uh, Brazil and training jiu-jitsu, I, I was working a full-time job, but anytime I had time off, I would always go and train. I was preparing for a jiu-jitsu tournament and as a kind of a workout, we'd always climb this mountain in Rio de Janeiro called Pedro de Gavia. Uh, that's the same rock for so, so some of you guys have followed Jiu Jitsu. That's where Holes Gracie actually died, uh, hand gliding. Um, and uh, anyways, uh, I, so I was there and um, I, we kind of went off the path a little bit and it was really wet and I had slipped. And it, it's a pretty high mountain. and. Uh, there's certain areas where you're okay. There's other areas that are way more dangerous. I had slipped and I was going feet first down the mountain and I was sliding down the mountain. My friend went to grab me. I had like a tank top on and he flipped me around and couldn't hold on and now I was going head first off the mountain and uh, all of a sudden I felt a bunch of air underneath me and I was falling and it was probably, I don't know, maybe like a 20 foot drop. So a pretty decent drop. Uh, and I ended up falling on like a ledge. It was like kind of like a rounded rock. And if I didn't fall on that ledge, I would have fallen like hundreds of feet. Uh, and it probably wouldn't have been good. I'm not sure I would have survived that one. Uh, and when I fell on that ledge, you know, it, it knocked the wind out of me. My friends who were up top, they couldn't see me. So they, they thought I had died. Uh, and uh, one of them was crying. One of them was like freaking out. And I could hear them talking and I, I it knocked the wind out of me. But like during that fall, I kind of had that like cartoonish type uh, life, like near death experience where I kind of saw, saw my whole life flash before my eyes. And the one thing that really resonated with, like, with me was, um, I can't believe I didn't follow my dreams. I can't believe I didn't follow what I really wanted to do. Um, I, I, was, uh, I was married at the time, I ended up getting divorced uh, because of all these changes, but um, I was working a job that was okay, I wasn't really happy doing it, but I wanted to do martial arts full time. Um, and I was too scared to pursue it. I, I didn't know, you know, like my whole family, they wanted me to go off and be a lawyer. Um, you know, my friends thought I was crazy for doing it. I didn't know how I was gonna make money, so I was scared of that. Um, and anyways, I had fallen, I realized I was still alive, and I just did a lot of thinking over the next two weeks and decided, you know what, um, I'm gonna pursue martial arts. Like, if I'm able to wake up and, at the time, put on a gi, put on a martial arts uniform every single day and do what I love, I'll find a way to, I'll find a way to make it happen. You know, I'll, I'll figure it out. And um, I went home, and, you know, told my, my wife at the time, I uh, told my family what I was going to do, and everyone said I was crazy. And uh, ultimately, uh, it led to mixed martial arts, and, and that uh, changed my life. There were some tough years of sleeping on couches and uh, 
you know, not having a whole lot of money and uh, asking people if they could pay for my meals. But um, ultimately, I uh, ended up figuring it out and, and it worked out well. Um, definitely a lot of adversity, but it taught me a lot. You know, I, um, I, I did a lot of growing up, a lot of, uh, a lot of maturing during those times. And um, almost everything I know is probably because of martial arts. How quick was it from coming back from Brazil after that fall to your first fight for first MMA? So I guess it was probably maybe like eight months to a year, something like that. Not yeah. long. Not, Not long. long. I mean, I had been doing jiu-jitsu for, I guess at the time, uh, six years, five years, uh, and then had my fight uh, shortly after that. So. So was it true in your third fight you got matched up against a really experienced guy in comparison to yourself and you impressed so much in defeat in the decision loss, Dana White was present at the event and you impressed him so much that he offered you a spot in the Ultimate Fighter? Yeah, I, I, I think like that kind of sums up my career in general is, uh, here Kenny, jump into the fire, figure it out. Um, and. and uh, I oftentimes competed against people like way more experienced than I did. And while ultimately it didn't give me the best record that I would want, you know, it wasn't this pristine record uh, statistics wise, numbers wise, um, it did force me to learn very quickly. Um, so in my third fight, I fought Drew Fickett. Uh, he had like 28 fights at the time. And I had, you know, yeah, three or four or something like that. and. Um, Dana White actually was there to scout out my opponent for this show called The Ultimate Fighter. Um, we had an absolute war. That was like the first time I had ever been punched in the face in a, in a mixed martial arts fight. And, um, and it was just this back and forth battle. Uh, I thought I won, he thought he won. It was a split decision for Drew. And uh, Dana White came back to my dressing room and said, hey, we're doing this new show called The Ultimate Fighter. Uh, would you want to be a part of it? you know, have your brother interview you and uh, send it in, you know? And I was like, I was so pissed that I lost, that I was like, yeah, whatever. Uh, and then ultimately, I, someone's like, dude, you gotta do this, you gotta send your video in. And I sent in like a, a DVD of me teaching. <laughs> I don't know, a lot of people know what DVD is, but uh, um, yes, <laughs> I sent a DVD of me teaching and they called me and, and told me to fly out to Vegas. Back then, there were no tryouts. It was basically an interview process. They told me that I would have to compete at 185 pounds on the show. And me being the dummy that I am, I was like, yeah, sure, I compete in jiu-jitsu tournaments all the time that are no weight class. Yeah, that sounds fun. So I did that, and, um, and that's how the Ultimate Fighter you know, started for me. When you guys went on the first season, I remember the famous scene when you guys didn't think you were fighting until the final. Yeah. And you were like, oh, we're going to fight, there's going to be a tournament. And Dana White was like, what are you guys thinking you're here for? What was that experience like? Yeah, you know, some, some of the, I thought we were going to fight, you know, the first couple of weeks I was like, or first like week or so, I was like, are we going to fight? I'm not sure, because now we were just doing a bunch of these, back then, the Ultimate Fighter, we were doing a bunch of those like, dumb challenges, we're like sawing a log and running around with like people on a table, like silly stuff. And then um, I didn't know if it was like a pivot on their part or if it was an original plan, but they were like, okay, you guys are gonna fight each other. And for a lot of the guys, they said, hey, you know, we're getting our weekly, you know, sti stipend to be there, but we didn't, you know, we didn't really like, you're not paying us to fight per se. And some people were upset about that and they were talking about that. And of course, everything is filmed, everything is recorded, and that got word to Dana, and Dana gave, you know, that's when he gave his uh, very famous, do you want to be a fucking fighter speech. It's very famous, still gets repeated now all the time. And the roster on that season, probably still the best, isn't it? Which is crazy considering it was the first season. You've got Koscheck, um, you've got Chris Lieben, Boris Griffin, Stefan Bonner. I mean, what was that experience like? Lieben and uh, Josh Koscheck were in your way class, weren't they? Yeah, exactly. Diego Sanchez. Yeah, you know, so it was um, it was crazy just because of the level of competition, you know. Um, I was the smallest. I was the least experienced. Um, and there were a lot of guys that were very seasoned and very good fighters as far as mixed martial arts was concerned. So I just did my best to try to learn from them uh, and pick up what I could. Obviously, you know, training with great guys like Chuck Liddell and Randy Couture, uh, that was tremendous. 
uh, learned a lot from that as well. But yeah, it was really competitive. You know, that I think it was that at that time where really they were looking for the best fighters they could find. Um, it wasn't so much about, hey, let's try to entertain the viewers at home. It ended up being very entertaining. You know, Chris Lehman, Josh Koscheck, Bobby Southworth, you know, Forrest Griffin, Stephen Bonner, they were, you know, Diego Sanchez. We had such an eclectic and charismatic group that it, uh, it worked out quite well. All the pranks were happening, weren't they? And I was saying to Chuck, you know, it's a good job Chuck wasn't a contestant on that season. If someone tried to prank him, they'd be in big trouble. Yeah. We also had like Diego Sanchez doing his whole breathing rituals, yeah. and Chris Lieben got really drunk one night, didn't he? And he slept in the garden. You know, what were some of the things that happened inside the house that were the most memorable for yourself? Yeah, you know, uh, certainly those those memories stand out. I think the one that stood out for me most was when. Uh, Chris Lieben and Josh Koscheck almost went at it, and Chris Lieben ended up um, punching through our door and split his hand open pretty badly, like to the point where he had to go to the hospital. Um, and I remember one of the fighters going to get me and waking me up, like, oh, you, you, they're, they're fighting. I go, what are you doing getting me up? Like the smallest guy, what am I going to do? You guys, there's like a ton of fighters, I'm sleeping. Uh, but I ended up getting up and seeing what the heck was going on, and. Um, you know, it was just another uh, crazy experience being in that house. It's, it was unlike anything I'd ever experienced, and it was kind of good that, you know, at the point of I was in my life, I was, you know, like I said, I was kind of like sleeping on my friend's couches and kind of all over the place, and, you know, um, and I kind of took it like, you know, oh, well, I guess this is just how people do it. Like, these guys are crazy. And... Um, yeah, it was it was a wild time for sure. And getting to the finale as well, you faced Diego Sanchez. You did come up short, but when did you find out that you were going to get a contract after that? Was it on the same night? Yeah, I, I wasn't exactly sure if I was going to, because at the time it was like you either win the final or you basically like restart. Like you go home and try to get back on the show somehow, try to get back on the UFC somehow. Um, so it wasn't until like a few weeks after that fight against Diego Sanchez that they called me and said, hey, no, no, we, like, you still have a contract with us. We want you to fight for us. Um, but the, the biggest thing for me was I had never experienced a high level of anxiety or nervousness before a fight. Uh, I was always pretty calm. And that final was so crazy because I remember hitting pads, warming up backstage, and I was exhausted after like 30 seconds. There was just so much emotion and so much nervousness in me. I didn't know what the hell was going on. Everything was happening so fast. And then I got in the cage and I felt like I was circling for an eternity. I, I was like a deer in the headlights. And by the time I was like actually fighting, Diego Sanchez was mounted on me, punching me in the mouth and I was bleeding and like I couldn't see anything. I had blood all over my face. After that fight, I really realized like, oh wow, like uh, nervousness is a real thing. Um, I, I need to address that, like what happened, what went wrong, and I really worked on trying to strengthen my mind the best that I could and, and figure out training methods that were gonna help me the most in preparation for a, a professional mixed martial arts fight. So that, that was pivotal. Also, I think I wasn't exactly sure I wanted to be a pro MMA fighter on The Ultimate Fighter. But when I lost and when I felt I was like embarrassed in that final, I said, I'm not going out like that. I, I, I gotta do something about this. I don't want that to be my lasting memory of, of my professional mixed martial arts career. So I became very, very determined to uh, right a lot of those wrongs. Went on a brilliant win streak in the UFC when you joined as well and you got uh, an interim, was it an interim title shot against Sean Shirk or was it the it was, vacant it, title it was, a, it was an actual title shot, was, yeah. Actual yeah. title shot, but it was, was it vacant at the time? It I was believe. vacant at the time, exactly. Yeah. Sean Shirk, who was an absolute beast at the, at the time, that was fight of the night that night. And again, you proved that you belong in the title picture, you proved that you belonged on the big stage. What was that experience like and what were your nerves like heading to that fight in comparison to the Diego Sanchez fight? Yeah, you, know, you, you only know what you know, right? And I think that anytime you face someone who shows that they're at a higher level, you have two choices. You go, well, I'm just not at that level, or I need to get to that level or surpass that level. 
And for me, that was one of those experiences yet again in Sean Shirk where I felt mentally I was in the right place, um, but technically I needed to do more. Physically, I needed to do more. Uh, I remember at the weigh-ins, weighing in against Sean Shirk, and I looked at him and I'm like, okay, I'm definitely, I knew I was taller than him, but he doesn't look that big. Like, he's not that big of a guy. And then on fight night, I saw this guy across from me and I go, who the fuck is that guy? He looked like he ate Sean Shirk. He was like three times the size of Sean Shirk that I weighed in against. I was like, my goodness. Um, so, you know, we had an absolute battle. I, I ended up cutting him. Um, I, his blood was actually all over me. It took me like three showers to get all the blood off. Uh, my shorts started out white, and they were as red as my shirt. Um, and it was like a, a, a pretty, you know, bloody fight. Maybe the bloodiest fight in UFC history. And um, yeah, that, that's when I kind of realized I needed to step up my game in all shapes uh, and forms, you know. You recorded one of your most famous and biggest wins against Roger Huerta. Not a lot of people might know who he is, but he was a mega star at the time, wasn't he? He was tipped to be the next big thing, and you derailed that hype train. What was that experience like? Yeah, that was a fight I really wanted. You know, there was a lot of hype behind Roger Huerta. He was on. He was the first. I don't know if he's the only, but he was the first UFC fighter or mixed martial artist to ever be on the front cover of Sports Illustrated, which was a very big deal at the time. Um, you know, he had the support of both the American fan base and the Mexican fan base. Um, he was, he, he had a phenomenal record. I think he was like, like almost like 29 and one or something like crazy record. And, um, and I ended up fighting him in his hometown. And we actually, we had like a, a PR tour prior to the fight. And I remember when uh, the PR person left the table it was just me and Roger. And Roger looked across the table for me and he said, you know, I am, uh, I'm renegotiating my contract right now. And I said, oh, okay, yeah, I heard, you know. And it was like this very contentious relationship between him and the UFC. He was this huge star and he was looking for a big contract from the UFC. And he said, Kenny, you know, no offense, but I'm gonna hurt you really badly in your fight. So, you know, don't take it personal, but I gotta do what I gotta do. And I said, oh, that's fine. I said, that's cool, man. I said, uh, we'll see what happens, you know? And uh, so since that moment, I was like absolutely determined to make sure that that was not going to happen. Uh, unfortunately, prior to that fight, I, uh, I don't know what the heck I was doing, but I wanted to like gain as much weight as possible for some reason after my weigh-in. <laughs> and I don't think a lot of, like a lot of people know this story. But I, I asked for people to get like cereal for me. I'm like, get me like a good, like healthy cereal at night. It was like midnight before my fight. And someone gets me like oat crack, like crackling, oat, crackling oat bran. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the cereal, but it's like all like oats and bran, which is not good what you want to do after you like shrink your stomach. And I had that and I was so sick the next day. And I, it was bad, like I was literally, <laughs> I was literally in the bathroom when they called me out for the Roger Huerta fight. And I was like, I'll be out in a minute. Like, and uh, I went out there and I was like white as a ghost. And uh, I remember like literally praying to God. I was like, just let me get through round one. Don't let this kid beat me in the first round. Like, I, I do not want to lose to Roger Huerta like that. And round one, I, I actually won round one and then felt a little more comfortable, one round two, one round three, and, and ended up winning a unanimous decision 30-27 against Roger Huerta in his hometown. So uh, that was an interesting experience. That was one of those where like, uh, you realize you need to kind of push yourselves, you need to push yourself to higher levels and also how a competitor uh, can, can inspire you to, uh, to, to new levels as well. You should have gone back to Roger Huerta and said, listen, I've just been on the toilet all night. I was sick as a dog. <laughs> yeah. and you still couldn't beat me. So where's that whole contract? To, I wanted to finish him so badly. I wanted to finish him so badly, but I also didn't want to get exhausted in the fight and have him beat me. So I had to be extremely measured, patient, and um, and composed throughout that whole process. I wanted to do more, but my body just cut, like couldn't really let me. So uh, lesson learned. A lot of lessons were learned. Where would you rank that victory in your career? Because again, you had to overcome a lot before you even got into the cage there. So where would you rank it? For, for whatever reason, I don't, uh, 
I don't really think about that one as my as one of my best victories, but I, I guess I suppose you're right. It, it was at the time it was a big victory, you know, it really was. Um, but if I'm looking at it honestly, I, I felt that there were a lot of holes in his game. There was a lot of hype behind him and the way that he fought and finished people. But from what I was seeing from my perspective, I saw a lot of um, vulnerabilities, and, and I, I felt that like if I lost that fight it would be a massive failure. So for me, I thought it was a pretty, it should have been a, a pretty straightforward victory for me. I like fights where I'm not exactly sure if I can win or not. You know, there's like the hope, but against Roger Huerta, for whatever reason, I was like, I know I can beat that guy. What was the fight where you had most fun in the UFC, where you was actually enjoying it in there? There's been a few of them. Um, I really like the Joe Stevenson fight uh, and the Takanori Gomi fight. Um, was a lot of fun as well. Um, so, and, and those were like two of my best performances, I guess. But against Joe Stevenson, I just had the opportunity to have fun. The first one, I guess, if we go back, uh, Kit Cope, it was uh, my second fight at 170 pounds in the UFC. And Kit Cope had been talking a lot of trash. And that was the first time that I had ever uh, experienced like, um, like that flow state of, of competing where Everything seemed effortless. Everything seemed like it was happening in slow motion. Um, and then, like, all of a sudden, my hand was getting raised, and I was like, wow, that was easy. I don't know, I don't know what the hell happened, but it, that felt good. And I kind of was just able to do my thing without um, really thinking about it, which was, which was cool. So that, that was fun, too. And over the years, you competed across, was it full weight class? You went from middleweight all the way down to featherweight, which I don't think that's been done before. But maybe, well, to be fair, BJ Penny competed all the way at heavyweight at one point. Yeah, against not the, the UFC, Chief, yeah, in the UFC it was the, the UFC, only. you're one of the only people, maybe the only person to do that. Obviously, it was over a period, a long period of time. What was that put, like putting your body through that, fluctuating? Yeah, you know, I, I guess, um, I'm not sure I consider myself a fighter necessarily, but I consider myself a martial artist. And out the street, if someone decides to attack you, you know, you don't have a choice to be like, how much do you weigh? Can we weigh in uh, in a couple weeks and we'll fight and see? You, you know, like, in my mind, I'm a small guy, so I figured, like, I gotta know how to defend myself against not just someone in my weight, but, like, anybody, potentially. Like, I gotta figure it out. So for me, it was, like, this great challenge of, like, okay, you're fighting 185 pounders. You're not physically, like, the most imposing guy. How do you get it done? And I felt like it was um, a good challenge mentally and technically for me to try to figure out a way. And you fought one of the best lightweights ever, BJ Penn. Was he your toughest opponent, would you say? Yeah, I gotta say, BJ at the time, like, uh, Jose Aldo was the best fighter that I ever faced, but BJ Penn was the toughest matchup for me, stylistically of where I was uh, in my career. I, I felt that BJ was, uh, was, the, was the biggest challenge for me. Drop down to featherweight, like you mentioned, Jose Aldo, and you know, that's a, a, a great way to go out. You go out at the top of the game, title shot. Was that something that you thought going into it, if it didn't go my way, I'm gonna leave at top of the game? Yeah, no, unfortunately, I, I didn't have it planned out like that, but um, I did know, and, and I made this decision, I guess, uh, midway through my career, I never wanted to uh, fight to get a paycheck. I always wanted to fight because I was physically capable of doing it, and I knew that when I was either didn't like it anymore, or when I was physically um, compromised in some way, that I knew that I would stop. And uh, after the Jose Aldo fight, I had injured my back. I was training, you know, full time still all the time, and I had injured my back again. It was like maybe like the fifth time in my career I'd injured my back really badly, uh, and this was the worst one. And you know, I, I knew that that was time for me to probably hang it up. And, and luckily, you know, I had other uh, engagements and opportunities like working for Fox Sports and uh, calling fights for the UFC. And um, I, I, I said, you know, I think this is time. You know, I was only 36, 37 years old, but, uh, and I, I, I would have liked to, but I also didn't want to uh, go out there with, with a compromised body and, and, uh, and not have me be at my best. Obviously, you work with PFL now, like you mentioned, 
the role that you've had with Fox in the UFC has led you to this with the PFL. How much have you relished the analyst jobs and the commentary duties that you've been doing? Well, I feel really blessed. Like, um, you know, I guess first and foremost, like I said, I'm a martial artist. I'm a fight nerd. I love watching fights. I love analyzing fights. And the fact that I have the opportunity to um, call fights and do what I love and get paid to do it, um, is, is a true gift and uh, I'm extremely grateful for, for those opportunities and you know whether it's you know doing the podcast or calling fights or analyzing fights it's what I love to do I get paid to do it and I feel blessed for sure you can see what a fight nerd you are you're so thoughtful and insightful when we're listening to you on commentary or when we watch you analyze a fight what would you say is the best fight you've ever called oh man that's a great question um, hmm. I think the most excited like I've been calling a fight was probably Bigfoot Silva against Mark Hunt what a fight. Uh, what a fight. in Australia. I believe it was Australia or New Zealand. I, I can't recall, but uh, that was like a movie fight. That was like two mythical characters uh, fighting each other, and you're like, "There's no way they can go past the first round." I may have actually said that. I was like, "There's no way this fight goes past the first round." And it was five rounds of absolute insanity. Uh, and, you know, being at moments like that was, uh, was pretty special. One of my favorite fights of all time as well. And just mentioning the PFL, the lightweight world champion is Brendan Lottnane. Or featherweight, featherweight. Sorry, featherweight world champion, maybe lightweight world champion yeah. someday. But yeah, Brendan Lottnane is flying the flag for the UK and, and for Manchester. How amazing is it to see that? It, it is amazing. You know, you look at Brendan's career, he was on a Dana White Contender Series. He won, but then didn't get the call. Um, ends up in the PFL, uh, does excellent his first season, falls short, but then comes back. Comes back and then has a really bad knee injury. Looks candidly terrible in his first fight. Second fight, again, doesn't look good, but wins both those fights, showing an incredible amount of toughness and, and determination and then comes back in the semi-final against the toughest guy um, in Chris Wade, a UFC veteran, and just puts on a show. I mean, like, it, it was like a clinic. Uh, he went out there and just dominated him, dominated every aspect of the fight. And I was like, okay, this is the Brendan Lockney that everyone expected, and then goes on to the final and does the same thing against Bubba Jenkins. It looked tremendous, and, and I think, I think had, a, had an injury there, maybe a broken toe or a foot heading into that fight. And um, I think those are the kind of performances that, that's gonna take Brendan to that next level. All that adversity, that experience, all those setbacks, and he's able to come back, that's what fighting is. You know, it, it's, it's easy to forget, and, and a lot of times we think, oh, you know, that, that, uh, that fighter who's undefeated, or that, but it's all about how you come back. The adversity, the struggles that you face, and how you come back after that, that's how I like judging a fighter. And Brendan Lochnane is one of those guys who I have massive respect for. And to see him at the end of the day win a million dollars last year, which is something that very few mixed martial arts fighters uh, have achieved, um, was awesome to see. And he, he's on his way to uh, achieving that yet again this year. Surely he's going to main event a PFL Manchester card in the next year or so. It's it has to happen. It has to happen. That would be amazing. Also, last one before we open it up to the fans. You have trained Jonah Hill in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Is that is that true? Yeah, you know, Jonah Hill was one of my, my private clients uh, when I lived in Los Angeles, and um, he is uh, an amazing guy. Like, uh, you know, there's some big superstars that uh, you know just talk to you in a different way or address you in a different way. And he is so down to earth and, and so nice and so fun. And having had that opportunity to be his his coach and his instructor and to see him advance and get better and improve uh, was an honor, man. It was it was really cool. What's his skill set like now? Do you think you could choke me out in like 10 seconds? You or know, something? I, ha I haven't worked with him in a couple of years, but he, man, he has gotten so much better. Uh, he got a lot better. I ended up moving out of Los Angeles, so I, never, I no longer worked with him. But man, the improvements that he made and how serious he was in doing that, not only to like get better at jiu-jitsu, but to improve his mental health and improve um, you know, his confidence in everything he did, I think, was was a big step for him. So, you know, I always say this, but um, martial arts is not like a magic pill for like anyone because 
I guess those people that are just horrible people will always be horrible people and, and sometimes will twist it to their advantage. But for those people that are good inside, that are looking for some kind of change, that are looking for some kind of strength, and are looking for something to, uh, some routine to follow and give them purpose in their life, martial arts is one of the best choices. Um, it changes you inside and out uh, for the better. And, um, and uh, I think for Jonah, it really gave him that, that peace of mind internally as well. So it, it's always cool to be a part of that process and to help people uh, through that. That's one of my favorite things about teaching.